Good morning and welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you're here. We hope that you will be willing to join us in worshiping our Lord and Savior in spirit and in truth this morning. A couple of announcements. First of all, uh, you will look in front of you. There are connect cards there. Uh, we would appreciate it very much if you would fill those out. Uh, give us any updated information we need to know. Or if you're a first-time visitor, would love to have you fill that out for us so that we can uh, let you know a little bit more about us later on this week. Just a reminder of two things. First of all, at 10.15 this morning, uh, we have two opportunities for you. One, uh, if you are coming for the Share and Care training event, uh, that is for the uh, training that is going on as we are partnering over with the uh, middle and elementary school across the street. I encourage you, you will be staying in here for that meeting at 1015. And then down in the small dining hall uh, is our Sunday school class on the book of Philippians. Uh, Stephen Davies is teaching that. It's been fascinating and wonderful the first two weeks. I would love for you to come down there for our August mini semester on that. Uh, just another note about Sunday school, uh, our fall Sunday school term will be beginning September 11th. Uh, this coming week, we'll be getting out the information on all the classes that you can sign up for and all of those good things. So be looking in your email for that. Uh, just a reminder for all men, we have the men's community breakfast coming up uh, Saturday, August 27th, uh, 8 o'clock here in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, you can find more information on that on our website. Uh, but encourage you, if you can, to come out for that. Uh, and then also on the 28th, we have the installation service uh, for John. Uh, he will be, go we'll be having that service in here, 530, followed by a reception dinner downstairs after that. Uh, strongly, again, encourage you to come out for that. Uh, today at 1 p.m., our uh, senior adult ministry, they'll be having their lunch over at Basilico's. So at the end of the uh, 1130 service, just start heading that way over towards Harrison Crossing. Uh, look forward to seeing you there. And then I have to make sure that I read this properly. I was told I didn't do this, the announcement properly last week for the congregational meeting. So let me read the official Presbyterianism. Uh, there will be a called congregational meeting on Sunday, September 4th at 1015 in the sanctuary for the purpose of approving changes to the church bylaws. A copy of the bylaws is attached uh, to the email that we sent out on Friday. Uh, and also there are some paper copies back in the back if you would like those as well. So again, 1015, September 4th, uh, we'll take care of that in this room uh, as well. Uh, I think that is everything that I have on my list. And I, we, I now want to call up uh, Pauline Johnson, who is going to give us an update on our nominating committee. Good morning. I'm not Pauline Johnson. This is Pauline Johnson. Uh, but Pauline and the nominating committee asked me to give a quick overview of the three offices that they are taking nominations for in the next few months here, that they are seeking uh, the Lord's will for who would be leading our congregation forward. Uh, the office of elder is an office that is about spiritual oversight, oh, oversight, oversight, um, it's about spiritual oversight and direction. It is protecting and promoting the teaching of the church. The office of deacon is about spiritual and physical care of our members. It is taking care of uh, those who are a part of our church body. And then finally, the office of trustee uh, equips and enables both of those other two offices by taking care of physical, logistical, and personnel issues to enable those other two offices to do what God has called them to do. So Pauline has a quick announcement from the nominating committee about their process in seeking uh, elders and deacons and trustees this year. Awesome. Thank you, John. We are excited um, to be in this season of asking the Lord for um, people to come and serve him in these roles. We have a staggered um, schedule where um, some of the people in each office group uh, leave and then the next year another group leaves and the next year another group leaves if that makes sense. I haven't had coffee this morning so mm -hmm. I'm not, I might not be explaining that really well but each year we have a couple two or three people in each group that have served their term and once their term is over, if they elect not to serve a second time or if they're ineligible to serve because they've already served two full terms, then we need to fill those slots. 
So the nominating committee is prayerfully um, going through this process. If you have questions about the process, please feel free to reach out to me um, or to Michael Albrecht, who's homesick, so we wish him well, uh, well this morning, um, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. But most of all, be praying. Uh, be praying for the Lord to raise up people who are gifted, who are in these areas, and who he is calling to serve um, our church and to serve him through this um, process. All right, and I'm up for call to worship. So if you are able, I invite you to stand uh, this morning. If you're not able to stand, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the Lord loves our posture, whether we're up or down, as long as we're in front of him and focused on him this morning. All right, praise the Lord, you servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let, Let the name, name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust, and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and the princes of his people. Praise the Lord.
sing of beauty, the greatness, the awesome works of the Lord, and to remind us of the foolishness of pride and arrogance. For how far exalted above all of us is the Lord. We go to him together today, admitting the times when pride and arrogance have separated us from him, and asking for his mercy to wash those times away in the power of his love for us. Would you join me in this morning's prayer of confession? Almighty God, rich in mercy to all those who call upon you, hear us as we come to you, humbly confessing our sins and transgressions and seeking your mercy and forgiveness. We have broken your holy laws by our deeds and by our words and by the sinful attitudes of our hearts. We confess before you our disobedience and ingratitude our pride and arrogance, and all our other rebellions and failures. We have sinned against you, your church, and our fellow men. Have mercy upon us, most gracious Father. Of your great goodness, grant that we may hereafter serve and please you in newness of life. Destroy every trace of sin, every hint of pride, and every spot of arrogance in our hearts. Through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the re renewing work of the Holy Spirit within us. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance from Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So let's rejoice and celebrate that we are free, accepted, forgiven, and redeemed. Let's sing and shout out our praise to our God who has made a way for us.
And thank you, Sandy, for keeping our, uh, our missions partners in our minds. Um, the, the Lord is definitely in this place this morning since we got the Presbyterians clapping. Um, <laughs> amen, amen. Uh, we're going to dismiss children uh, grades second and under to Kids Church at this time. Uh, we're not going to do the catechism question that they're... Are we going to do the catechism question that they're doing? Is there a slide for that? There is. Okay, for some reason I thought we weren't. Uh, The kids are learning a version of the Lord's Prayer that is directly out of the the ESV version of Matthew. And so we're going to read that version with them this morning. The catechism question they're learning is, what is the Lord's Prayer? I'll ask the question and we will all say that red part together. What is the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Oh yeah, and we're all like, oh, we're supposed to keep going. But that's where it ends in the the version in the book of Matthew, and so that's where we're ending it for the kids this morning. Kids, if you're second grade and below, you can go ahead and head towards the back, uh, and then we're going to take that clapping Presbyterian energy into a time of fellowship and greeting this morning. Let's stand and say hi to somebody around us. Good morning. Um, It's my privilege to lead us in prayer today, so um, let's go to the Lord and pray with me, please. Lord, you are worthy of honor and praise. We come to you as a people who are devoted to Jesus and following his way. We We bring our requests to you, trusting that you see us, hear us, and care for our needs. Enable us through the power of your spirit to quiet our hearts and focus our minds as we hear the preaching of your word. May we respond with faith and action. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us grace and forgiveness. Thank you for the fruit of your spirit that causes us to live in joy and peace, that helps us to be patient and kind, that shows your goodness and faithfulness to the world. We ask you to give wisdom, discernment, guidance and humility to our government leaders at all levels. We trust you to work good in our community and are humbled to be a small part of it. May we faithfully continue to build relationships with the schools across the street, equip us to share in their lives and care for their needs. For the sick among us, we ask for healing. For those mourning a loss, we ask for comfort. For those worried and burdened, we ask for peace. God, you are so good to us. Give us eyes to see you and your way. And now we join our voices to pray as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We got to do that twice today. <laughs> All right, our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew six twenty-five through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The word of the Lord. All right. In 1993, 128 runners gathered together for the NCAA Division II Track and Field Cross Country Championship race. Around the two-thirds mark of the course, one of the runners in the middle of the pack, whose name was Mike Del Vaco, noticed that the whole crowd ahead of him had started going the wrong way. He would say in later interviews, I was waving for them to follow me. I was yelling that they were going the right way. I was saying, this is the right way. Del Vaco was right. He had noticed a badly placed sign saying which way the course was to go at an intersection, but only four other runners followed him. The rest continued on what turned out to be a shortcut that allowed them to finish the race much more quickly. In a much criticized decision that I think was probably covering their own posteriors a little bit, the race officials decided to allow the abbreviated shortcut course to stand as the official one for the race. And so Mike Del Vaco, rewarded for his rule obeying, finished 123rd out of 128. I think there's something inside all of us that knows that that outcome, uh, that there's something wrong there, that that is not right, that that is not just. But the reality is that the world does not necessarily reward you for staying on the right track. In this case, it didn't reward him literally for staying on the right track. And It can sometimes seem this this path, this journey, this race that we're on can feel confusing. It can feel crazy. It can feel out there. In, In the words of the cinematic and musical masterpiece, A Muppet Christmas Carol, which you all laugh, but my wife groans because she knows I'm serious. Uh, Life is like a journey, but who knows where it ends? The, The path that we follow is deeply important to us. It decides where we end up, and it matters because God is with us every step of that journey. So today, we're looking at a passage with a strong journey theme, and we're going to see where our focus needs to be on the journey, what to do in the hard moments of the journey, what to watch out for on the way, and how to stay on the right path. So let's start by digging into Isaiah chapter 35, starting in verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of of our God. The passage starts here by putting our eyes firmly on the prize. It launches, it blasts off with a note of eschatological hope, uh, a hope that is beyond anything that we can know in a natural sense, a supernatural hope. 
But it does it at the same time as it acknowledges the reality of the Israelites' current situation. A reminder, Isaiah's ch- Isaiah chapters 1 through 39 focuses on prophecies that come before the exile. These are in the dark days where Israel as a nation has begun kind of falling apart. They're starting to see the enemies chomping at the bit. They're starting to lose track, uh, lose any sense of control as a nation. And so in these dark days, Isaiah describes their situation as the wilderness, the dry land, the desert. It's barren areas. And we have to remember, this is ancient Israel. This isn't modern technology. For the last five years of my life, I lived in an irrigated desert, a place where 200 years ago there was just flat desert in every direction, but through dams and canals and aqueducts and 500 foot deep wells, they'd turned it into one of the agricultural bread baskets of the country. This isn't that. This is ancient Israel. If it's a desert, it's staying a desert. If it's a wasteland, it's staying a wasteland. If it's the wilderness, there's nothing that's going to change that not by any natural means. But the promise is still there. He says the desert, the dry land, the, where, the, the wilderness is going to be like the forests of Lebanon. The, the forests of Lebanon would have had the reputation kind of like our sequoias or redwoods have today. These giant, uh, absolutely like mind-blowingly large trees. The cedars of Lebanon were known for thousands of miles in any direction. That if you wanted the truly greatest of beams for your palace and boards for your ships, you would go to the forests of Lebanon to cut them. But... Those cedars, those sequoias and redwoods, the reason they're so rare is they require incredibly precise conditions to grow. You have to be at the right altitude. You have to have the right conditions in the climate. You have to have the right amount of moisture during the year. You have to have the right animals and other kinds of trees that support them in their early days as they grow. There's this incredibly difficult network that you have to have that is, you're just never going to find in a desert, a wilderness, a wasteland, but the Bible says, no, it's still going to happen. And it's going to happen because God makes it happen. We, I think, know somewhere deep inside that we need this kind of supernatural change. We understand, as human beings, that, there, that we live in a world that is broken. There is something that is just plain wrong about the world that we live in. Uh, We're we're doing work in, in the next few weeks here and months with a tool called the Three Circles that helps us understand kind of an easy, genuine way to talk about the gospel with folks who have never heard about it before. And that that method very much says anytime someone admits that the world is broken, that's permission to talk about the gospel, because this is something that we can kind of all agree on these days. Things are not the way they should be. Things are broken with the world around us. And the reality is all of our attempts to fix it so far have fallen flat. We've tried this and it drops back in. We've tried going over here, but it falls back. We tried escaping this way, but we always get sucked back into something being broken. I've heard frustration in recent months and years, especially from folks in older generations trying to deal with uh, younger people who are trying new political fixes for things that they see as broken in the world. But it's actually an opportunity, I think, for us as Christians to affirm people and say, yes, you are seeing something true. You are seeing something correct. The world is broken. And the ways that we have tried to fix it as human beings don't go all the way. We can make it a little better. We can fix this. We can fix that. But we cannot fix it in its entirely. Our current political philosophies, economic schemes, legislative patterns, whatever you want to look at, they have all taken us to a flawed and broken conclusion. But as Christians... We have a solution that we can offer that is not based on any specific political, economic, or philosophical system. Because we have a system, we have a solution, excuse me, that is built on a person. It's built on supernatural intervention from God. That is something that that you can't find in some other random ideology. We have a good news. 
we, we have the good news that this brokenness is not all there is. And again, I think we know this as human beings, naturally. Otherwise, we would just all look at the brokenness and say, well, that's life, and we have to live in that, oh well, and keep going. But that's not how we are. There's something inside of us that says there must be a way that is better. There must be something that is the right way. Man, I'm bad at drawing hearts. There is something that that is good. There is something that is right. There is something that is whole. And we as Christians say, yes, there is, there was, but we got ourselves over there. We, We decided we knew better. We call this God's design, and we decided we knew better in Adam and Eve, and each of us, every day since, decide we know better, and we can be in charge. But we need this hope. We need the reality of something existing that is outside of that brokenness. Whether we're Christians or not, we need that hope because the road is not often or always or even often easy. And so verses 3 and 4 talk about, okay, how does this apply when we face the bumps in the road? Let's look at Isaiah 35 verses 3 and 4. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Again, just like those first couple verses acknowledged where the Israelites were by talking about the desert, the wilderness, the dry lands. These verses acknowledge the brokenness of the world, the hurt in the places where we are by talking about Um, our hands being weak, our knees being feeble, our hearts being anxious. This is the natural state for us as humans when we face the, the roughness, the brokenness of the road that we're trying to travel. These challenges, these struggles... Uh, the things that we go through, they've been universal to human experience for millennia, and now we even have new and exciting ways to carry that stress and anxiety with us wherever we go. This is a great story I saw a few months ago about a hiker who ignored calls on his phone from people trying to rescue him because he thought they were spam calls and he wanted to save his battery for when he was able to actually talk to someone who mattered. We have all this stress and all this anxiety and all this stuff piling up on us. And when we face that, when we try to face that stress without a supernatural hope of restoration, when we try to fight our way back there by ourselves, the most logical conclusion is that it's going to turn us into raging control freaks. Because if I've been hurt, If I've really experienced the wounds of the world, the hardest parts of life, the places where the road breaks down, then the natural response is for me to turn around and say, I am going to take every bit of control I can out of life, and I'm going to make sure this never happens to me again. If we're going with the road analogy, it's time for me to turn in my minivan or car for one of the giant pavement rollers that you might see doing work out on I-95. I'm not letting that broken road deal with me anymore. I'm taking control. It's not in my way. I'm in its way now. We try to seek and pull all of this control to ourselves. Andy Crouch uh, is one of my favorite Christian authors. He wrote, Control is the dream of the risk and loss averse. It is the promise of every idol, and it is the quest of every person who has tasted vulnerability and vowed to never be exposed in that way again. Control, power, grabbing as much of it as we can and holding on to it as tight as we can. That's the natural human response to facing brokenness. And we don't just do it in our own lives. This is the fun one. You may have heard of the phrase, it's been popular for 40 or 50 years now, of helicopter parents. It's where you hover over your kids and you make sure nothing can ever hurt them and you say, well, there's a new phrase that's become really popular in the last decade or so. I've heard it from people as diverse as um, child psychologists to high school guidance counselors. Uh, It's a new type of appliance for parents to be related to. Have any of you heard of lawnmower parents? 
So it's no longer enough to just hover over and make sure that if something goes wrong, I'm there to drop my special forces unit in and take care of it. I need to go in front of my kids and slice down anything that could possibly get in the way on the path that I've picked for them. Our parenting can also be affected by the ways that we've faced hurt in the world and the ways that our our natural human reaction says, control everything so that that hurt won't get repeated, either in your life or in somebody else's life. But the reality is, if I'm trying to control the world myself, I'm putting myself out of control eventually because I just can't do that. I'm not good enough. I don't have it all together. I can't control everything. Goodness knows, half the time I feel like I can't control anything. I'm in this brokenness, so me trying to control the path back to here is silly. I'm stuck here. I'm never going to get out of it if I'm the only one working to get out of that brokenness. And that's What this verse is calling us to see, it's calling us to see you need something that is outside of that brokenness to heal you. You need something to come and get you out of that brokenness. it's, It's telling us that there is someone who can give strength to our weak hands, firmness to our feeble knees, who can comfort our anxious hearts, that there is A person coming, from Isaiah's view, coming, we would say as Christians, a person who has come, who will be able to purely and perfectly bring us all the things we need in life. He will bring us both justice and mercy. It's right here in the verse, excuse me, verse 4, where it says, Be strong, fear not, behold your God. Your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He's bringing justice. There will come a day where Mike Del Vaco finished first in the 1993 Cross Country Championships because that's what justice demands. Justice will one day take over because this person will bring justice with them and that person will also come to have mercy on us and to save us. The end of verse 4, he will come and save you. We can fear not. We can be strong, not because we are strong in ourselves, but because someone has come to save us. And this is where we as Christians have such a beautiful story to tell, where we, we say that there is a God who sees this cycle, who knows this cycle, and who said, I love you too much to leave you in this cycle, and I will make a way back through my son. He says that when we turn and we believe in him, we believe in God and in Jesus and what he's done for us, he will make a way back to him. So what happens if I turn away from that brokenness and I believe that God has made a way for me back? Verses 5 and 7 have some answers there. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. For the third time in a row, the passage offers us hope while also acknowledging the hardships and the roughness that we experience. It says we will have to deal with blind eyes, deaf ears, mute tongues, lame legs, figuratively and literally in ourselves and in the world around us. That brokenness is there and it is real, but the passage tells us that by trusting in God and looking at Him to be the one who is in control, in trusting the good news of Jesus, those hard realities don't define us anymore. Our our identity, the core of who we are, has moved, it has shifted. It's not in that brokenness, even though we still experience it. It's in the gospel. It's in Jesus that we're now finding who we are. And And so as we see our identity here, 
we get to start seeing progress, or as I, I like to call it, restoration. We start getting to see restoration. It doesn't mean our lives are perfect right away. It doesn't mean everything bad disappears. But we get to see that Jesus starts making things new in our lives and around us. This is where I really think that the Christian social ethic, the way Christians look at the world around us and at living with other people around us, is so unique. Because we can acknowledge two realities that most ways of looking at the world say you have to pick one or the other. You, you can't have both of those. So we can acknowledge over here the world is broken and it's going to stay broken. We don't believe that we as humans have the ability to fully fix and perfect and make the world exactly as it should be or should have been from the beginning. It'll stay broken, but we can put in tension with that because of the hope of Jesus and because he is using us as his tools, as his servants, we do have hope to start seeing some restoration to start seeing some progress, to see ways that God renews things and brings new life into them that weren't there before. A former president once asked, do we settle for the world as it is or do we work for the world as it should be? And we, we Christians say, we have a, re we have a religion, we have a way of looking at the world that both acknowledges how things are and that gives us the strength to move towards how things should be. This is, if I was going to put a capstone on what the Bible means when it talks about justice in the Old Testament, this would probably be it. Justice is working towards seeing the world and experiencing the world the way God meant it to be. It is us being God's hands, his feet, his ambassadors as he works in the world to reshape things. And in pursuing this justice, I think it gives us an open door for sharing the good news of Jesus with people. Pastor Charles Holmes Jr. said, Justice, biblical justice, is a fire to ignite the next generation. It is a pathway to gospel proclamation and gospel demonstration. It's a way for us to show what we mean. It's a way for us to show what does this look like. What is that good thing that our hearts are yearning after? Let me show you a little bit of it. As one person once said, uh, people need to want something to be true before they'll consider whether or not it is true. I can argue for the validity of this until my, my hair turns gray, but if people don't want this to be true, they're not looking for a way back. So that by, by doing justice, by trying to reshape the world in God's image in our own small ways, we're giving people little glimpses of that and we're trying to make them want it. When we do it in our, our lives, our homes, our schools, our workplaces, our church, our communities, and as we do it without becoming control freaks, or thinking that we have all the answers, or having no humility about it. As, as we show this picture, knowing that even when I'm out of control, God is in control, it shows the people around us the good news, and it helps them to start saying, I want this to be true. How can this be true? How can I get back there? Our passage this morning contains one final warning and one final comfort as we are looking at uh, as we we're looking at the gospel. So let's read verses 8 through 10. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall fall away. The warning of the passage is a warning against universality. This is a warning that we, we hate as Christians for good reason. It's hard to say something is limited. It's hard to say no. But this passage and others throughout the Bible make it very clear not everyone is on the road to restoration. 
The, the passage dives in whole hog at this point to the road analogy, the path, the way that we're supposed to be walking on. And it's a beautiful road. It's full of gladness and joy. It's free of predator and bandit. But not everybody's on the road. It, is, it says in the passage, it is the redeemed who walk there, the ransomed of the Lord. But it says, the unclean shall not be found there. So to get on the road, we need to be cleansed from our brokenness. This brokenness doesn't end up back here because then it would pervert this back into the brokenness. We need to get cleansed of our brokenness to find our part on the road. So we think, again, this is one where we have to be careful about our natural human urges. Because if I buy into this, if I buy this gospel, my natural human urge can be, "Uh uh-oh, this is limited. Not everybody's going to be there. That means there's not enough space for all of us. I need to show that I'm better than the people around me. I need to show that I'm better than them in some way, shape, or form. And it gives rise to all our human ways that I say, I'm more valuable than you because. I'm more valuable than you because of age or mental acuity or skin color or number of zeros in my bank account or physical attractiveness or perceived social status. Whatever it is that we as human beings use to say, I'm better than you, is because there's a part of us inside that says it's limited. It's limited. And I have to work really hard to get in. I have to show that I'm good enough to get in. But that's not how it works. That's not why the road is limited. The road isn't limited because there's not enough space for us. The road is limited because none of us deserve to be on it. None of us are good enough. None of us can earn it. None of us can get on it by ourselves. Because the reality is we all stink in some very real ways. We are all selfish and prideful and and, and vain and so on and so forth. You can go through and find little ways and big ways, for, for me at least, where we all fit into those categories. And the good news is God knows and God has taken care of that. Let's look at the end of verse 8. It says, It shall belong the way, the way shall belong to those who walk on the way. Wonderful, the way belongs to me if I'm on it. How do I get on it? I must need to be good enough. I must need to be smart enough. I must need to be great enough. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Oh, Wait, wait I, I thought I needed to be good enough, but it says that some of the people on that way are fools. I would say all of the people on that way are fools to one degree or another. God's very clearly saying here, no, stop measuring yourself. Stop deciding if you've earned it well enough, if you're good enough for it, if you're smart enough for it, if you're this, that, or the other enough for it. Stop trying to be the hero. You're a fool. Jesus is the hero. Let those be the right places for people to be and move forward with it. The way is a gift from God. It is a gift from a God who loves us beyond what we can imagine, who loved us too much to leave us off of the road, and so he came to lift us up. Because we would say, especially as Reformed Christians, we would say we're dead in our sins. That's the analogy that the Bible loves to use. You are dead in your sins. If there's a road to get to heaven, not only am I not on the road, I'm in the graveyard next to the road. I'm not trying to get back on the road because I'm a corpse. And corpses don't get up and walk around despite what the zombie movies tell you. (laughs) We need to be drawn up out of our graves And this is where it's so beautiful because Jesus came down and he took the place in the grave for us. Jesus came down and as the Bible says, he he became sin so that we could be cleansed. He was torn. He was shredded. he He was broken for us so that the lions and the beasts could find no purchase in our flesh. He was the man of sorrow so that we could obtain gladness and joy. The passage says here, it's the ransomed, the redeemed of the Lord who who belong to the road, who are on the road. Well, Jesus paid our ransom. Because the truth of these three circles, I had a great conversation with one of our deacons about this earlier in the week. The truth of those circles is, my identity might be here, and I might be seeing places in my life, in my family, in my community, where God really is starting to bring restoration. He's bringing beautiful things through His Spirit working in my life. We still live here, 
And there's still parts of all of our hearts that pull us back to here. I'm still selfish. I'm still prideful. I still have things that are pulling me back towards that brokenness. So for us as Christians, every day is, I wake up and I put my feet on the road. Not because I deserve it. Not because I go over my litany of how great I am every morning. I put my feet on the road by remembering who it is who's put me on that road. The ransomed of the Lord. The ransomed of the Lord shall walk upon it and shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. It's by him that we take one more step on the road to Zion. Let's close in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for this reality that we find in your word, this truth that we find in your gospel. We pray that this would soak down into our hearts. Lord, help us to stop trying to hold on to the control of everything in our lives. Help us to stop trying to prove that we're better than other people, but to be able to find rest from both of those things. Oh, the rest of being able to let go of the wheel and trust that you have it. The rest of not having to prove that I'm better than everybody around me anymore. Help us to find that rest in you, to, to let our hearts rest on the road to Zion, to know that it is the place of the ransomed of the Lord, that you have paid it all. You have paid the price for our sins and we bear them no more. And then help us to be people who hold that hope out to our friends, our neighbors, our, our co-workers, our fellow students. When we see that they are stuck in that brokenness without hope, help us to bring them the hope of your good news of who Jesus is and of what he has done for us on the cross. We pray all of this in your name this morning, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able this morning as we sing together once more before we go. Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like clouds before you.
I'll remind you if you're going to join us for our Philippian Sunday School class, it has been a blast the last couple of weeks. It is wonderful learning about God's Word together. Uh, you're going right out this door and you're following the signs that say Philippian Sunday School class. If you want to learn about our Share and Care program as we're partnering with educators across the street to encourage and support them throughout this year to take the kindness and the love of Christ into our schools, you're staying here in the sanctuary. We're going to have about a 15-20 minute conversation about what that's going to look like. Go with the words of this benediction. It's from our passage this morning, Isaiah 35. May the Lord strengthen our weak hands and steady our knees that give way. May He say to our fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance. With recompense, He will come to save you. Amen and amen. Let's go in peace this morning. You are the one.